morning. Um, wanted to offer a read into the astrology of this week and look at what's coming up. Um, hello to everyone. Good morning. Obviously, it's a lot going on. It's been an intense week. And um, I think that there are a lot of really powerful messages in the astrology right now to tune in with. Um, so before I say anything else, I want to say that um, I'm not a historian, I'm not a politician, and I don't know a lot about the situation in Russia and Ukraine. I probably know just as much as a lot of you. Um, and I'm not necessarily like trying to give an opinion on, on any of that. Uh, I wanted to feel into the astrology. And so always take what works and leave the rest. See what lands for you, see what settles. I spoke about this a lot in the Pisces season workshop that happened this past Monday. Um, but one of the kind of major occurrence and the major themes astrologically right now is an ongoing sextile between two outer planets, uh, Pluto and Neptune. This sextile has been forming since the 1940s. So um, since World War II, it will perfect in the 2030s uh, through the 2040s. And outer planet transits uh, take a really long time. So this is a 100 year transit, basically. It's in application. Uh, that means that it's forming, it's, it's gaining strength since the 1940s. There have been periods of time when the sextile perfected already. Um, and currently, Neptune and Pluto are just within um, five, four to five degrees uh, of each other throughout this year. So that's a pretty good orb of influence, um, as we say in the field. Um, and again, these outer planet transits are descriptions of the the collective current, they are era defining um, energies. And their transits are so long that they comprise uh, major influences for any of us in our personal lives. And when we're reading into astrology for ourselves and we look at what the outer planets are doing, we have to consider the ways that we as individuals are shaped by our conditions um, our social locations, our bodies, our families, our cultures, the countries that we live in, and then of course what's happening in the era, in the time, um, because this is going to hugely right affect our lives. Um, you could have the basically the same chart that you do now and be born at another place in the world, right, or another period in, in history, and your life would be drastically different. Um, because we're not here just alone. We're here participating in the unfolding everythingness, and that's part of what astrology speaks to. Um, so in this sextile, we have these two outer planets, and the outer planets, um, when you read into astrology, and especially with Pluto, you'll often get kind of horror stories, you know, and they, they can represent really big, scary themes and the inevitability of change and the inevitability of destruction or something like this. And so Pluto does have a symbolism of a death force. And I want to say that there, um, there is a positive death force, right, that equals um, uh, fertile decomposition, right, the death forces of, uh, th that we find in the natural world that are part of the continuity and the cyclical nature of life. And then there are negative death forces, brutality and destruction, the death forces that humans um, internalize and impose upon one another. And as our societies have grown and as we have moved into the 21st century and um, we have the technologies that we do, these death forces have become institutionalized, right? And so um, some of you might be familiar with uh, this framework of the four eyes of oppression. I learned this from my friends, uh, Michelle and Ramon Gabrieloff Parish, but they talk about the four eyes of oppression always being interwoven and overlapping, ideological, institutional, 
interpersonal or interrelational and internalized. And these death forces that Pluto uh, represents, we can see that symbolism throughout all of these landscapes. Um, so one of the major uh, points of symbolism for Pluto is oil, okay? And, and it's uh, Pluto forces and Pluto is related um, as a contemporary ruler with the sign Scorpio. And so Pluto forces uh, what has been um, hidden underground, buried underground, held in containment for a long time. It forces that to the surface. This can be positive in some ways, like a deep psychological excavation, right? When we go deep inside of ourselves and we have to look at um, ancestral trauma, right? Or what has been suppressed in the memory, but is really affecting us in our daily lives and our relationships and our health, etc. And when you go through Pluto transits uh, in your own life, you'll notice this, right? And if you're working with astrology, you might look at Capricorn in your own chart and what's going on there and what's been happening for you since 2008 with Pluto's transiting presence. I bet that on some level you can see that there's been an excavation of material and that there's been an excavation of what has been um, repressed or forgotten or held really tightly or held in some kind of containment because you were scared, right? Or there was fear energy in the body. This is often what Pluto speaks to is the way that things get locked and held um, and the power of them, right? The power of that locked energy or of that frozen energy. And when we harness that power, um, there can be incredible healing and incredible transformation. Uh, and when that power is tapped or when it's triggered um, in a way that is either unconscious or that is consciously destructive, then that power becomes a massive force of destruction. Okay, so oil, right? Here we have um, literally, you know, the, we have literally a substance of death, right? A breakdown and a decomposition of um, other life forms held deep within the earth. And human beings figure out that they can extract oil and that that will give them power, right? So this is a big symbol for Pluto. And mining and extraction is a um, Plutonian kind of uh, activity or industry. And again, I am not, <laughs> I am no expert on geopolitics. I don't really understand much of the situation that's happening um, in Eastern Europe. But when I look around the world, and think about like, what the fuck is going on? You know, why, why at this point after um, such massive suffering, after so many wars, after such catastrophic um, circumstances that have mutated our planet and our bodies and have, have contributed to just horror on and on, why is this still happening? And there's, some, there's an answer, right? When we look at oil and we know that um, the territory under siege right now is an oil rich country and that both the United States and Russia and other world powers, NATO and, you know, as a, as a, um, alliance, like it, there is, there's a, there's a lot that we want to think about in terms of oil, right. And just access to power, consolidation of power and dominance and control. And these are Pluto themes. And when we feel, Pluto themes in our own bodies and in our own lives and in our own relationships, it's not going to be at the same level, but it will be a similar theme, right? So when a Pluto transit hits you, say you get Pluto um, opposite your Mars or something like that, you might experience a phase in your life when you are called to look at the ways that you have grabbed for power. And maybe your grab for personal power happens emotionally, right? And um, uh, or maybe it happens through the way that you work really hard, or the way that you uh, punish your body and want it to look a certain way or function a certain way or something like that. And so again, we've all internalized um, oppressive ideologies, right? And the continuous messages of the institutions that that something is wrong with us, right? Because this is how oppression works. Um, and in these symbols, with, with Pluto's symbolism, 
to dominance and control, we also have symbolism because Pluto is moving through Capricorn of military, right? Militarized um, uh, readiness for conflict, right? Armament, right? Being armed for something. Uh, Capricorn rules the structure. It rules the skin and the bones. It rules the way that we hold a border or hold a boundary. Again, this can be expressed beautifully, right? It can be expressed absolutely beautifully um, when we look at the, the borders that the earth forms over time, right? Like basins of lakes or uh, groves of trees that are centuries old, right? And the strength and the bark of the wood. Or when we look at relationships that are built over time, rooted in trust, and the boundaries of those relationships become fortified, there's a lot of integrity with them. We can lean into um, the, the safety of those spaces, right? These are beautiful representations of that Capricorn instinct. But again, unconscious or consciously destructive um, manifestations of this energy turns into border wars. It turns into militarized conflict, right? And the instinct to um, assert oneself in ways that lead to a perpetual state of war, right? Because there's not listening, there's not sensitivity, there's not that balance in the Cancer Capricorn axis where there's um, tenderness and feeling and emotional intelligence. Um, so I wanted to kind of think into uh, some characteristics that I've been studying um, and these are the characteristics that are uh, uh, white supremacist characteristics, right? And there is a um, document you may have seen in your life that was written in the 90s uh, called The Cultural Characteristics of White Supremacy. That document has been turned into a website. I think it's called uh, whitesupremacycharacteristics.org. I'm pretty sure if you search it, you'll find it. Um, and this is a, it's a really interesting breakdown of the uh, embodied, energetic, uh, living and cultural manifestations of uh, supremacy culture, and then looking at how particularly um, supremacy culture enacts through whiteness. And I'm not going to go through all the characteristics. There's a number of them, and they are fascinating to look into because when you look at them, you realize that these are characteristics that are valued. Like when you know when you read through them and you think about what you have been shown as a potential for your life, especially if you think about ideas of success and professionalism and um, what we've been fed culturally around like dominance and individualism, right? Individualism is one of those characteristics. The idea that there's one right way, you know, there's only room for one. Y you better be that one, you know. So. Again, we have instigation, provocation, reason, motivation to become militarized, right? To compete with each other, to mistrust each other, to fight against one another. If we feel like, uh, you know, someone's going to steal our shit, right? We have not been um, cultured and entrained in this particular era to value the interrelationships and community, right? And what, what can actually thrive in... Uh, generosity, which is abundance. We've this is a this is an era of scarcity, right, and fear, and so fear is one of the of these cultural characteristics. And I want to say that um, at this point, you know, I I think that these characteristics are, you know, they're global, right? They're everywhere, and so this particular document and website really looks at. Um, an American racialized uh, context. And when we look at the threads of um, imperialism, right, it's like we can see that supremacy culture uh, perpetuates itself with the same characteristics over and over. And it has traveled through whiteness and European and American imperialism in a very particular way that has dominated um, for centuries now and has uh, a, a lot of impact across the world. So this is a document called The Cultural Characteristics of White Supremacy, and it's also a website. Um, so if we think about some of these characteristics, fear, 
right? This is a, this is a cultural characteristic. It's an embodied characteristic. Um, I grew up in the United States. I have had access to incredibly loving, healing, supportive community. I have felt fear in my body my entire life because that is what, at this point, um, the saturation in these soils produce, right? In, in America Incorporated, right? In, an, in a notion of a nation that is built on fear, right? Not cooperation, inclusion, um, uh, coming together across difference in love, but theft, enslavement, um, rigidity and oppression, religious terror, you know, it's like fear is in our fucking air, it's in the climate. And that fear then gets filtered through, again, um, the ideologies and the institutions. And so the fear that I might feel in my white femme body growing up in the 80s and the 90s, right, in the 2000s, like I might feel all kinds of different fear, fear that my body is, uh, doesn't conform to certain standards of, of, of beauty or value. And that's gonna cause me to be violent against my body. I was just talking the other day with someone about, like before recognizing I was a queer person and mistaking attraction to other femme people, mistaking that as competition, right? And then feeling mistrust, like femme competition, femme mistrust, and that being a, a, a rupture in the fabric of connectivity that meant that not only did we not receive each other's support, but there was toxicity bubbling up in the space between us, right? And on a larger level, when we look at how does fear come down through these ideologies and institutions? It's going to come down filtered through our social locations and filtered into our bodies and filtered into our relationships and we will internalize it in the ways that make sense for our particular embodiments. But however it is that we're internalizing it, the fear is still working to control us, right? When people are fearful, they're not paying attention to the abundance that is available around them. They are distracted and um, separated from one another. They, they are not uh, joining and connecting and sharing resources, right? They're in states of scarcity and survival. And that is what capitalism wants of you, right? And it's what all of the supremacies like religious supremacy, gender supremacy, whatever. It's like, if you're fearful, you are easier to control. One right way. That's another one of these characteristics. There is only one right way. Only one God, only one way to the top, only one right way to wear your hair, only one right way to have a family, only one right way to love. There are so many scripts, right, within these cultures that tell, that tell us in, in these supremacist ideologies that tell you there's only one right way. Meanwhile, take a pause, right? Like step outside of the human context and look around at the environment and the earth is uh, infinite biodiversity, constant adaptation and evolution. The earth does not have one right way. The earth has an infinite right ways. Everything is a possibility. Every interaction, every moment of connection opens a new possibility, right? Any relation, there are no two relationships that are the same. So these ideas of one right way, of, of fear, the urgency, right, that, that fills our bodies when we are in survival modes, um, this is what's kind of coming up for me as I'm responding and trying to metabolize what I'm reading in the news right now. And I think like a lot, you know, like a lot of us, I feel really scared. I feel really confused. And I feel so sad and enraged that my entire life, this war has been going on. The Cold War never ended, you know, like when I was six or something like that. It was like, uh, and you know, endless war, constant provocation, 
And these imperial powers doing the things that they do to keep us in, in states of conflict, to keep us in states of fear, to keep us in, um, in urgency. And in this, um, in this document, one of, or on the website, one of the things that they talk about is how urgency as a characteristic is, um, it's a really important characteristic in that, again, it narrows the focus. It shuts down relational capacity. It diminishes empathy. But there is no urgency for peace, right? There's not urgency for justice within these systems. And so urgency gets really confused. And if you're waking up at five in the morning because there's bombs dropping in your neighborhood, of course you're gonna be urgent to get the fuck out. And if you're across the world reading these stories, urgency, right, adrenaline, fear, and stress hormones is going to rise up in the body. And across the world, all of us are going to contract a little bit, right? Oh no, like what? this could happen at any point for all of us. And a lot of people will take that energy and turn it into the individualism, right? Because that's how these, char these characteristics work together. And they function through all of these layers. So we feel urgent and it's like, what do I need to do? How do I need to protect my family? What do I need to survive? And again, that's going to feed into a sense of conflict, right? This stress state. You might not feel like you are competing against your spouse, but if you wake up in the morning and these are the chemicals that start to arise in your body, I bet you're not going to have as much capacity to be present and loving and attentive to the actual relationship, right? People are in states of urgency. They're in spaces of distress. And after 20 years now of working with bodies, it is very clear that consciousness gathers around distress, right? When our bodies are injured, they go into holding patterns, into distress patterns, and the nervous system rewires around those patterns. And then it experiences a state of amnesia because our nervous systems are adaptive. They're evolutionary, right? They're moving towards the necessity at hand. If there's an injury, they go to protect it. Once that injury has healed or once the threat has passed, the nervous system is not getting the message because how it receives messages is through, right? Like <laughs> pay attention kind of moments. So once the injury has passed or, or, or healed or the, the threat has passed, um, on a body work level, what we have to do is then retrain the nervous system. We have to look for sources of support. One of my teachers says, um, support precedes movement, right? So if there's a place that's stuck and frozen or held into a fear pattern, we have to resource that space, right? We have to give it love. We have to show it that there are other options and there is support and then it can let go. Same thing interpersonally, right? Same thing in internally. Um, when we're in states of fear, when we're in states of trauma and holding patterns, we have to find the sources of support so that we can let go. Now, in this day and age, the sources of support that most of us need are relational. And someone just mentioned this connection to autoimmune disorders. And absolutely, there's a huge connection between states of stress and autoimmune disorders and chronic illness. And one thing that I'll say before I say something more to that is that these, um, these states of stress and the, the chemicals that they produce are addictive. They're addicting in a particular way. And not to say that, that we want to reach for them consciously, but when the nervous system is stimulated, when we go into spaces of high alert and high sympathetic activation, right, in the sympathetic nervous system, there's a quality of feeling alive. <laughs> and if you experience that over and over, that your energy and your awareness and attention is peaked when your nervous system gets a particular kind of jolt or shock or activation, then in moments when you don't feel like that, what you're left with are the feelings underneath. The grief, the overwhelm, the feeling of, oh, fuck, what now? 
And those sensations are incredibly uncomfortable for a lot of folks. And if there isn't support, right, we need support in order to move. If there isn't support to feel into those states and to process them, then what we're going to do is re-traumatize ourselves and re-traumatize each other. And this is how trauma continues to enact um, across all levels of our existence, right? And there are a lot of quotes out there, and I'm not remembering any of them exactly, but it's like, you know, if you want to control people, you have to control their fear, you have to control their minds, you have to get into uh, the, their inner beings. Once they've internalized the trauma, they, they will continue to enact it. They'll continue to, to live into these states of oppression, create them themselves. So now the link, right, between Pluto, what we've just been talking about, and Neptune, this comment about autoimmune. Neptune and Pisces, um, both of them in medical astrology speak to symptoms. And these kinds of symptoms come from everywhere. And so for folks out there who are working with autoimmune situations, this is your reality, right? Anything at any moment could set off the inflammation. Is it gonna be mold? Is it gonna be a state of stress? Is it gonna be something that you ate, right? That kicks your histamine levels uh, into some kind of overdrive and your mast cells. And then your body goes into an inflammatory state and then you get these symptoms. The link between Pluto and Neptune is the link between the forces of destruction as they enact through the ideologies, institutions, interconnections, and as they are internalized, those forces then affect the environment. So when we have centuries now of practices of mining and extraction, right, we talked about uh, Pluto being connected to oil and fossil fuels and consolidation of power and imperial powers, right? These are symbols of Pluto, embodiments of Pluto. What does that lead to? That leads to landscapes that have been raped of their um, nutrients, right? Their, whose soils have been polluted and made radioactive. That leads to high levels of toxins in water. It leads to particulate matter right, molecular uh, compounds now floating through the atmosphere, coming down in the rain, saturating the soil that is going to grow the food that we all eat. And the, the situation of, of autoimmune, right, is an environmental situation. It's not someone's personal failing or the, the lack of like immune response that their particular body has. An autoimmune condition typically is a cumulative result of historic and familial trauma, uh, epigenetics, genetic coding that have to do with mutations, that's a Pluto word, and survival, that's another Pluto word, right? The ways that our DNA and genetics adapt in order to hold these states of survival and fear or the lack of access that an ancestor, our ancestors had, the lack of nutrition, the fear that they experienced in their bodies, etc., that mutates our cells. On top of that, living in a society that for the most part does not provide support, right? So if it was just that, if it was just the ancestral factors and then we lived in a world that was really about meeting us here and now and helping us to heal, right? And giving folks what they needed in order to shift these old patterns, we would shift it, no problem. But we live, we live in a world where there is not support for most people, right? There's not, there's not support for folks with chronic illness. There's not support for folks with autoimmune um, diseases. A lot of times the medical industrial complex doesn't even believe you with your symptoms. <clears throat> On top of that, then we have cultures of stress, right? Like this constant uh, feeding <laughs> of fear that's coming through the airwaves, it's coming through media, it's coming through uh, interactions with institutions on all levels, it's coming through relationships, it's coming through scarcity mindsets. People are sick. With 
Pisces and Neptune, we also have issues of contagion, right? And, and Pisces speaks to the interpermeation and the way that energy passes and influences the everythingness. What we've been learning over the last three years, again and again, hitting us on the head, right? We are interconnected. We share the air. Nobody, <laughs> nobody has their own personal supply of air. Even if they're in their fucking rich person bunker with their own military, they're still breathing the air. This is a state of contagion then, right? So this is a Pisces keywords, is a contagion. The link between uh, the, con the conditions that can create COVID or some, you know, some kind of virus like this constant encroachment of, of the human realm upon the animal realm. Um, lack of support, right? Lack of, pri of uh, preventative care. People's immune systems already taxed. People already in states of stress and fear, right? Those stress hormones make you very susceptible to illness. Then we get a mutation, right? We get a virus, it's passed through the air. It spreads everywhere. Right? We're all affected. Our bodies are affected. And when our bodies are affected, it's not just our physical bodies, right? People are getting COVID and it's not just that um, their lungs are contracting and they can't breathe. Uh, what's happening in the mental state? More fear, right? What's happening in the emotional state? More separation, isolation, mistrust, survival strategies how the fuck am i going to get out of this worry about friends and family right feeling of the lack of access and support that's all emotional mental emotional physical then in our bodies we get a uh, more endocrine response this is what we worked with on monday in the pisces workshop and someone just commented neptune also rules panic so yeah, the, the overwhelming emotional state is Neptune, um, is, is Neptune's symbol. And that overwhelming emotional state could be a lot of different emotions, but certainly the emotion of panic uh, can come in really strongly. And when we think about Neptune and Pisces and their relationship to the collective uh, and collective sentiment, right? Collective panic is a really strong force. And it's a really strong force for... Uh, governmental powers to harness, right? Or totalitarian powers to harness. So the link between these these two energies, Neptune and Pluto, is a link between uh, the institutional, right? And the structural. And then what happens in the energy state? This is Neptune and Pisces. Delusion <laughs> is a big one. Like we forget what's actually important. We forget that we live on a intelligent, alive, uh, sexy, infinitely creative planet that we somehow, you know, have the good fortune to live inside of and with and co-create with, right? We forget our access to magic, our kind of birthright to bodily pleasure. And then it's like, what's actually important? Well, what's actually important is that my group, you know, wins over your group or some shit like that. So Neptune and Pisces can also speak to the states of delusion that are uh, populism, right? Like group mindsets or um, xenophobia or these kinds of, of states of fantasy and illusion of superiority. Um, slippage, right? Like uh, reality... Re what what is reality <laughs> that's that's a big neptune piscean kind of state here we are in the era of fake news um and then the the takeovers of our minds with all the stuff they're getting fed with propaganda with fear with the misuse of power with the misplacement of of priorities and then our minds go into these spaces where it's like we're not paying attention to where we actually are, to who we actually are, and to the space between us, which is energy, right? Such, such incredible, um, subtle energy in the space of relationship that if we were aware of and could tend to, 
we have so much creativity. We have so much to give to one another. We have so much to offer to ourselves with presence. Environmental breakdown, pollution, toxicity, contagion, illnesses and afflictions, inflammation, then extinction. These are Pisces, right? These are states of Piscean, Neptunian affect on the body. When we encounter this, as we all are, right? When we hear Vladimir Putin give an announcement that if he doesn't uh, get the thing that he wants, then he's going to press the button and nuke everybody. And he's saying there's going to be no winners here. Sick, right? Sick mindset, sick in the emotional body. This is not the first time that some sickened <laughs> world leader has, has th threatened the globe. And certainly not the first time that sickness has affected individuals and groups of people with its absolute disregard for their lives right, or happiness. And so this feeling of what do I do, right, this, this state of uh, insanity that has um, created these institutions that, oh, that, that powers the militaries, right, like the, 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 this constant world of war, right, any of us, right, in our soft, small bodies, like what do we do? we are overwhelmed, right? And this is a very big Neptunian state, the state of emotional overwhelm and the thickness of grief and the impossibility of comprehension of what the fuck is going on. It's too confusing. And it doesn't make sense when it registers in our bodies because our bodies are instruments for love. Our bodies are instruments of attunement. We are interrelational, interconnected beings. We transmit energy between ourselves. You can feel when the person next to you is in a bad mood. You can feel when your friend is really giving you their attention and their love. We are so sensitive. And when we live in worlds that are completely insensitive and that barrage us with assault constantly, it's overwhelming. And that overwhelm then leads to a lot of things that are all Neptune related, right? So grief is a huge one. There is so much unprocessed grief in our atmosphere. Centuries of grief, millennia of grief. It's these systems of dominance that have systemically wiped out uh, indigenous ways of knowing, right? That have systemically slaughtered the midwives and the healers and uh, the ones who knew how to speak to the earth and the ones who held communities together and enforced their individualist, paternalist, urgent, fear-mongering <laughs> fucking ideologies. Insanity. This is associated with Neptune and Piscean state, right? Mental dis-ease. It doesn't make sense. Nothing I do is going to change it or stop it. I might be able to survive, but maybe I'll never thrive. Like, what, what is the point of this life? Where do we go from there? You know, pe people can break down and that can lead to all kinds of different uh, mental and emotional states. There's a meme out there I think I posted the other day that's like, um, you know, some scene from a TV show of two people talking and one of them is asking the other, do you have a history of mental illness in your family? And then that person's answering like the term mental illness is rendered meaningless in this state of capitalism or something like that. And it's like that where it's like, yeah, our mental, emotional well-being uh, is absolutely interconnected with the state of things. Right. And the state of things is madness. Anxiety and depression. Um, and then. What happens in, in these states, right, these states of grief, overwhelm, insanity, depression, anxiety, is our coping mechanisms. And so this is a big one for Pisces as well, is the ways that we cope. And a lot of us, myself included, it's like we have coping mechanisms that are um, 
just feeding into more of the same. And so those coping mechanisms can be addictions. That's a big one for Neptune, right? Um, in, in the Pisces state or the reaching for some kind of substance or experience that numbs something or gives us a reprieve or lets us get the hell out. Um, other strategies of disassociation, disembodiment, um, a lot of us have great strategies for that. I mean, these devices are wonderful for disassociating and disembodying, right, and zoning out, like I'll just scroll, right, shopping, things like that. It's like there are lots of, there are lots of ways that we can numb ourselves. Um, so I think that when it comes to these environment, uh, these astrological signatures of the moment, again, I, you know, not, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not a, um, uh, an expert in geopolitics. I don't know like what the next thing to do is. Tawny Holt just sent a request to be in my live video. I feel like Tawny might have something to say. Did you mean to send that request? Just send me a note. Say yes if you act, if you wanted to chime in. Sometimes you can press the button. They're close together. Um, so I think the place that we start when we're when we're trying to work with these astrological energies. I mean, for those of us here in our soft small bodies, you know, if we don't have militaries to control and don't have access to someone in power, um, in their ear. Um, we want to start with the emotional side of it, right? With the grief and with the overwhelm. And so th this is the place where, um, the idea that support precedes movement can, can really come in, I think, to support all of us. Um, there's a lot to feel right now. And I noticed that in the last 24, 36 hours, um, I've had to really navigate in myself, like, when can I feel the, the feelings that are actually coming up, the panic, the anxiety, the sadness, when can I feel that? And when do I need to click into another space so that I can be functional in the ways that I need to be functional in the moment? When I'm in that other space of functioning and there's unprocessed emotion, um, that unprocessed emotion is still going to affect me, right? That when we compartmentalize uh, our grief and our trauma and our fear, it's not that it goes away and it's just going to sit quietly somewhere, you know, waiting for us to deal with it. It will still be there doing the thing that it does. And the thing that it does is um, the thing that any cell does, right? It's trying to process itself. It's going through some kind of metabolic process. So if I'm not feeling the feelings that are present and I'm just trying to be functional, those feelings are still trying to sequence themselves out. And what they might have access to um, is a tension pattern in my body, right? I might really start to notice that my head is hurting or, my, or I feel really nauseous or I'm really tired, I'm really fatigued. This is a big one for unprocessed feelings. It's like, fuck, I'm so tired because our bodies integrate through sleep and dreaming. These are Neptune states. So in the, in the signatures of right now, in this sextile between Neptune and Pluto and in what's happening this week, where we have Mars and Venus conjunct, traveling through Capricorn, sextiling Neptune, and then moving next week into conjunction with Pluto, um, I wanna say that as horrific as these signatures are in the illustration that we're getting in terms of politics and war, these are also signatures that we can read in a really different way, right? And so if we think about the, the positive potential of Pluto and the need to extract and pull up um, the, the kind of depth of what has been suppressed and look at it. Um, if we think about the transformational potential, the psychological potential of those um, kinds of experiences and then what we do with them. If we think about the positive uh, signification of Neptune and Pisces, compassion, love, an outpouring of love and an outpouring of compassion 
this is a world that is suffering and all of us are suffering. And when we encounter suffering in others, um, if we don't immediately go into a survival space, we feel our hearts break. One possibility of this sextile, this growing sextile, again, that's gonna take us into the 2030s and 2040s is a global peace movement. I wanna say that, is a global peace movement and absolute transformation of these systems of oppression. It will happen because of the people, not because of the leaders who are invested in maintaining structural power and dominance. It will happen because of the people feeling, right? Like feeling our connections with one another, feeling the feelings that we have not felt for a long time, metabolizing them, grieving. On the other side of grief, you know this because at some point in your life you've wept, right? And on the other side of that weeping and of that catharsis is an inhale. It's an inhale. Right, and then this profound sensitivity that enters the body where it's like, oh God, you're grieving too. Right, when we feel our own emotions, we have space to hold space for others' emotions. So if we start here with the anxiety, with the overwhelm, with the fear, with the depression, with the coping mechanisms as they come up, you know, start in the most personal space. Feel what needs to be felt. You'll have to titrate. You have to go in and out of letting yourself feel things and then coming out. If you don't vacate entirely, right? If we don't (laughs) permanently take vacation, um, then what that leads to is, is more and more presence, more and more agility and capacity to work with our own emotional state and to recognize when we're getting triggered and when we're getting traumatized and then what that does to the internal state and the interrelational state. Again, going back to those um, four eyes, the interrelational, the internalized, the institutional, and the ideological. We can personally work on what's internal and what is interrelational. When we work with our own internal state, right, we can start to shift it. That's going to shift the relational state. Pisces as an as an energy, right, and, and Neptune as a signature is a description of love is everywhere. Love is in the small spaces, in these small spaces of interconnection, in the in the subtlety and the subtle uh, vibrations that arise personally and relationally. In this particular moment of heightened conflict and terrorized climate, any interaction, right, that we, that we can engage in that has a quality of peace, that has presence, that has love, that offers support, that allows some movement, right? Support precedes movement. If we don't have the support that we need structurally, we have to find it for ourselves and we have to give it to ourselves. And there is a lot of support available when we tune in to the subtle frequencies that Neptune and Pisces both speak to. Spend some time um, looking at a flower. You know, notice its in- intricacy, its delicacy, its uh, pr- profound embodiment of complexity. Spend some time. If you have a friend or, or a critter leaning up against each other, try and tune into that frequency, right? Move your awareness into the point of contact and then fill that contact with presence. And what you'll find there is love. You'll find support. You'll find peace in your body. It's not hard to access it when you pay attention. Neptune sextile to Pluto. Um, When we're able to connect with subtle frequencies, right, subtle energies, then what we can do is we can transmit. And in these spaces between, we can transmit. I want to say that there are more of us who want peace in this world than there are who want war. 
And it doesn't matter where we're from, what languages we speak, what our you know, social locations are. There are more of us. There are more people who want peace than who want war. Now, the ideas that everybody has about peace might be different. And this is where conflict can arise, right? Because we live in a global paradigm that there isn't enough for everybody. Those are interstitial places, interrelational places, where we have to build um, qualities of presence and listening, where we have to cultivate emotional agility so that we don't feel threatened by somebody wanting something different. <laughs> Right? Where instead maybe we could get curious about how our different points of view could even create a new thing. Maybe it's not even about what you want or what I want. Maybe it's about what happens in the space between us when we really start to listen, when we really start to get curious about uh, what is living. Suffering creates more suffering, right? The world is suffering. This is a, this is a planet in crisis right now and all of us are affected. People are affected in very different ways. Um, Prentice Hemphill, in a talk I heard them give, uh, said something so brilliant that trauma happens, right? Trauma exists. It's it's part of our lives. Like we're gonna, people are gonna die. People are gonna get injured. There will be catastrophes that happen. That's inevitable. But unequal distribution of trauma and the pushing of um, massive trauma onto certain groups of people or specific embodiments, that's oppression. And so in this moment, right, in this moment of 2022, um, as we're tuning in with the frequencies, right, that we have access to in our own lives, um, when we can tune in with the remembering of suffering and the curiosity for each other around how are you suffering, not with this misplaced Piscean Neptunian savior complex. That's another Neptune keyword, right? Like, how are you suffering? I'll fix it for you. No. With curiosity, with subtlety, with sensitivity, with care, that is a huge amount of support. It's a huge amount of support to feel seen, to feel heard, to have your concerns taken seriously. People with autoimmune know this, right? You know this after however long you've spent being gaslit by the medical industrial complex. If you find a practitioner who really listens to you, you probably wept. The feeling of you hear me, you see me, you acknowledge my pain, that in and of itself, that feeling is so transformational. Because most of us in this world, right, we, we are living in these institutionalized ideological structures of individuality. We get force fed ideas that it's up to you and you alone to deal with your problem, to deal with your distress, to deal with your pain, to deal with your illness, right? If, if you have a problem, that's your problem. Suffering creates suffering, but healing creates healing. And that's part of what I think this sextile is offering is that healing can create healing. And while it might not be happening at the level of uh, the military industrial complex, right? It can happen in the bodies and in the individuals because the military and the police force and ICE and the government, they and other governments, you know what makes up all of those groups? People. People with hearts in their chest, people with guts in their bellies, right? People with blood flowing through their veins and energy transmits. We have a lot of collective trauma, I'm not saying that just like tuning into love is going to fix everything in the world. But I do want to say that in this signature, we have a potential for a global peace movement. There are more people who want peace than there are who want war. And when you look at the folks who are protesting, right, and what's happening in Russia right now as, as people are protesting against the brutality of their government, the government is cracking back, right, arresting people, beating them. That's the fear that we have to confront here, certainly in the United States, with uh, growing fascism 
and terrorist movements in our own internalized fear, right? What happens to me if I speak up? Fear, right, is a huge motivating factor. When we're talking about Pluto, it's like you will control people if you can make them afraid of you. If they are afraid, they won't speak up. If they're afraid, they won't protest. And if we have support, and if we can tune in with presence, our fear can be quite motivating. We have to have discernment. Um, we are our environments, you know, we are made of the stuff that is around us. And we also create our environments. When we're thinking about Pisces, we're thinking about the ways that the body creates the environment around it. You know, our skin cells fall off, our hair falls out, uh, the perspiration in our breath comes out into the environment, right? We create our environments. So there is a potential right now, and I think a lot of us are probably tuning into this, is that we want to do the opposite of what these dominant forces of oppression are telling us to do. If they're telling you to stay fearful and silent, then tune in with your heart and find your courage. If they're telling you that it's scarcity out there and there's only enough for, <laughs> then give it away. If you have resources, give it away. If you have time, give it away. If you have love, give it away. Abundance thrives in conditions of generosity. Scarcity mindset does not lead to generosity, does not lead to abundance. When we share what we have, we've got plenty. Do the opposite of what the system is telling you to do. I know not everybody can realistically right now because you do need to eat and survive, but you know, there's a large movement right now of people who are stopping going to work. They're stopping business as usual because this feeling, this Neptunian feeling of like, why does it matter? Why am I gonna keep waking up going to a job that I hate when I'm getting messages that within 10 years, maybe there's not gonna be an environment that I can live in? Or when Vladimir Putin's saying that maybe in 10 minutes, he's gonna blow the fucking thing up. Stop going to work. You know, or if you have to go to work, go to work and speak up. Talk to your coworkers, be present with each other. Share love. You know, what, what do you need to do that's actually important? today what is actually important can you invest in that just a little bit invest in that right slow down the urgency of running and trying to survive slow down and connect remember that you're a human and someone else is too listen feel grieve right our these our culture is telling us there's no space for grief it's too urgent there's no space for your feelings, so hold space together. Get people on a group call, let people share. Don't try and fix each other's grief. Give people a listening space, right? Hold your friend when they're crying. You don't need to fix their grief. You need to attend to your own, but in that space, there is support and support precedes movement. Make ceremony, make ceremony. You know, these forces of dominance, if we think about Pluto and Capricorn as a signature, we look at, you know, cycles of Pluto and Capricorn, they line up with the United States Incorporated, right? With the signing of the Declaration of Independence, when this fucking place um, codified itself. The, Pluto and Capricorn lines up with um, whatever king, whatever his name was, uh, giving, you know, the Spanish and Portuguese... Um, slave traders permission basically to you know start the transatlantic slave trade saying you know god's on our side and we're going to now institute this global paradigm of uh violence and oppression right this is pluto and capricorn cycles and in those cycles capricorn rules the earth and the old earth right if we think about pluto as a force of dominance and then we look back at just the you know the last 500 years there is a has been a systematic erasure and uh, wiping out of indigeneity 
And it happened in Europe before it happened in Africa, before it happened in South America and the Caribbean. It, it happened to the European peoples. You know, this, that these ways of knowing that are connected with land, that are relational, that are embodied, that are queer, you know, that listen to spirits, that understand God within the self, like these are wiped out and they're replaced with uh, Christian fundamentalism, you know, with religious wars and with misogyny and patriarchy and then racism and, you know, all the isms. It's like, so what's been wiped out? Ceremonies, right? Our, our ways of being in reverence, in listening, and then what gets asserted and inserted are their rules, right? One right way, paternalism. So make ceremony. We have lost so many people. 13,000 people died last week, right, of COVID. Hundreds of people just died today. They're dying right now. They're being shelled. They're being bombed. These are our ancestors now. You know, how do we make space to remember people that we don't know? Make space in your day, you know, feel it. We have to feel what's been lost. We have to grieve it. We have to make space for that. If we don't do that, then the option that we have is numbing out and going crazy because that's what it, you know, that's what it does when we look at that Neptune signature. We don't feel the feelings that are there. We're going to go crazy. You know, we feel isolated. We feel depressed. We feel sick in our bodies. We can remember. You know, there are still people. There are still cultures who remember. The in indigenous ways have not been completely destroyed. They are living. They are still thriving. There are indigenous elders emerging now. And they need support maybe that's you you know maybe that's maybe you're a descendant and part of a lineage of in in traditions right that know how to listen that know how to attend to the land right the this is this is i think what we want to tune in with right now when we think about this uh potential of pluto and and neptune in their in their sextile how do we remember these deeper ways of knowing these earth-based ways of knowing. Old earth is Capricorn. Pluto as a transformational force brings us into the deep psychology that has kept us from that knowing. Whether or not you are immediately descendant of, of people who know how to listen to the land, somewhere in your lineage you are. We are all, we all come from people who knew how to listen. And we can, we, we can go back in our cells, right? My, my teacher, Bonnie, talks about, um, you know, again, support precedes movement. And that when we're looking for support, we might have to go all the way back to an origin. But the origin is healthy. The origin is well, right? Our stem cells are omnipotent when we're starting to uh, form in utero, right? We've got lots of different cells that could be anything, they are well, they know their capacity, they know their potential. As our bodies form, they are moving in biological choreography that is well, that, that knows how to form into a life form, right? That is high intelligence, supreme intelligence. We have access to that. We have to remember it. And we have to remember it by dismantling the systems, the internalized systems, the interrelational systems that keep us forgetting, that keep us in states of fear and survival. Plenty of people, you know, plenty of teachers have said this, like we have to lift, <laughs> we have to lift these chains off of ourselves and we have to dissolve them. We have enough of everything, right? We have the resources that we need in our own communities and in ourselves. And with you know, with Pluto, one word that comes up uh, when I think about Pluto is mutation. And I just want to take a moment to think about like on an imaginative level, because this is what Neptune and Pisces asks. It asks for imagination. How might we mutate from here? 
given the abundance of chemicals in the water, given the uh, lineages of violence that we are coming from, that we are living in currently, how might we mutate in here? Like what? what could possibly start to transform within us, within our ways of being and tending to the land and caring for each other that would incorporate everything that is present, right? We're not asking to be uh, in, in another place than we are. We've got to start with where we are. How can we incorporate all of this and turn into some kind of future being that is a different iteration, right, of what humans have been for the last several hundred years, um, at least within this global paradigm of fear and oppression. If we can tune into spiritual connection, if we can tune into uh, the, the expansion that is possible in a moment like this, in a moment of profound fear, because I think that that is part of what comes through in these moments of profound fear is that we go, it is not business as usual. What is really important? You know, when we receive a big shock to our systems, if we're not going into numbing out, then we get expanded in some ways. When we can tune into that, how might we start to reform ourselves, to shift in subtle ways? right, to adapt and evolve, to mutate in new ways um, that build more support. Support precedes movement. Um, the last thing that I wanted to say is that this week, uh, Mars and Venus are conjunct. Like I mentioned, they're traveling through Capricorn. They are working with the asteroid Vesta. Now, Vesta is a really interesting symbol because it is related to uh, priestess energy to feminine uh, spiritual servant energy, to the divine beings who tend the sacred flame, uh, to the beings that recognize eroticism and embodiment as healing. And Vesta was appropriated um, as, as they all were, as all of the goddesses were, um, and the gods. <laughs> it was appropriated and put to use for the military. And when you read about Vesta, if, like you look up the Wikipedia, article, you'll read about how, um, and I forget the years and I forget the exact um, correlations, but one of the Alexanders, one of the conquerors in Greece, like one of the Alexanders, um, you know, there, there'd been the conquering, there'd been the wiping out of indigenous symbols and the city was under siege um, and it looked like they were going to lose. And his advisors or something said, it's because you don't have the goddess here. And go go read the Wikipedia article. There's more there that I'm forgetting. But so they erected a temple to Vesta and then um, they won the war. And, and so I want to kind of think into Vesta as this um, symbol that is the appropriated uh, power of the feminine, of the divine feminine, and the appropriated power of, of priesthood or priestesshood of sacred service. Um, that that energy has been appropriated and put to war. And when they harness our femininity, right? Does it matter what genitals you have between your legs? It's like the feminine energy of connection and relationality, the ability to nourish and foster life, right? To create safe space for life. When they harness that in service of war, then we have militarized borders and boundaries. This priest, priestess, um, sacred service energy, right? When they harness that and make it about the state and survival and money and power, right? Then we have endless war. We have lifetimes of war. All of us on this call, our whole lives, the world has been at war and pl plenty of people on this call have probably been in proximity to it, either directly or through family members or our whole lives, right? And it's just not new. It's not new with us. We can reclaim that energy. Okay, so I think working with astrology for me uh, often is a practice of reclaiming the symbols for myself 
and asking, how do I want to tune in with this embodiment? With Vesta, I want to tune in to the tending of the sacred flame inside of myself, my own life force. What brings you joy? What connects you with life? What helps you listen to your body? What helps you tune in with your heart? How can you tend to the sacred flame in relationship? Right, cultivating presence. The space of relationship is so nourishing, potentially, right? When we're really present with each other, that, that contact right, allows us to know ourselves. It allows us to grow. That feeling of support makes so much possible. Um, I also want to just talk just for a moment, also bring in Vesta's association with erotic energy that Vesta, at least as a symbol, as a temple priestess is related to sacred prostitution. That's not the word for it either, but, but the working through the body and working through, um, eroticism and sensuality and sexuality. These were priestesses that would work with warriors who came back from the battlefield traumatized and they would help them come back to life by remembering pleasure. And so in this moment, as I think a lot of us are kind of in shock, trying to think about what do we do? What do we need to do? What's going to happen? How do we help? There's a lot of answers for all of that. And I want to encourage all of us in me <laughs> to remember the subtle space in between us and our interconnections to hold in our mind's eye and in our heart the possibility for a global peace movement, that in the next 10 to 20 years, there may be a radical transformation of this world that is a mutation that arises from the remembering and the metabolizing of the trauma that is existent and that turns into some new way of being, a new way of being that is profoundly attuned that harnesses the technologies that we have built in ways that serve the earth, right? That serve the sacred fire. Take space to be in pleasure as much as you can right now. And remember that energy transmits, okay? So when you come into contact, when you are in a space of knowing your own heart, of knowing your own capacity for love, of, of moving into your um, subtle body, in a way that is present, so you bring that into the space of relationship. The Pisces season workshop that I taught on Monday has a meditation. Um, I'm going to put it out, I think, for the new moon um, here. If you want to access that earlier, go to my website, embodiedastrology.com. Um, in the workshop section, you can find the recording of the workshop. It's sliding scale and there are also unlimited scholarships. So if you don't have cash right now, you just click a button and you'll get a code and you can get the workshop. Um, and there's more there about working with your chart, about working with these energies. And there's an endocrine meditation that is really powerful. It's really powerful practice um, that helps you tune in with inner body states that can transmit. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Um, I'm wishing you peace in your heart today. I'm sending you love. I can't see your faces, but I know that you're there in your bodies. We're here together. We're always together. We're always connected. <laughs>